and welcome back to the channel. You've joined myself, Dr. James Gill, for another clinical skills video. And today we're doing a deep dive on the examination of the shoulder. So we're joined once again by David. And in order to start off um, the examination of the shoulder, we need to appreciate that we're going to be doing the standard look, feel and move orthopedic assessment. So something I think is worthwhile putting in at this point in the video is making sure that we are understanding the anatomical movements that we're going to get from the shoulder. So we should expect to have flexion forwards, we're having extension backwards, we have external rotation, we also have an internal rotation, but unfortunately we can't get past the abdomen. So we will internally rotate by bringing the arms up behind the back. We have abduction, which is where we're moving the shoulders away from the midline, and adduction as we're bringing the shoulders back down. With that understanding in place, as we begin the um, movement of the patient, we should have a good idea in our mind as to when we come across an abnormal range of movement or perhaps a reduction in range of movement. Now, I have said an abnormal range of movement first because it is possible that people have conditions such as Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos um, where they are, um, have more lax connective tissues. As a result, these patients may be more flexible than other patients. And this can be causing uh, problems for them because they have increased movement to the joint. So it's possible they can get increased levels of discomfort based upon that. So when we're looking at the range of movements of the joint, don't only focus on patients that have a reduction in this movement. Where possible, when we're taking the history from a patient with shoulder pain, we want to see if we can identify particular movements that are causing the discomfort. For example, somebody trying to um, undo their bra may have problems um, related to subscapularis. Conversely, somebody having difficulty raising their arm over their head to brush their hair could have a problem with the rotator cuff muscles or potentially the glenohumeral joint itself. So even before we get onto that, we need to make sure we gel our hands and gain consent. So, hello, my name is Dr. Gill. I've been asked to do an examination of your shoulders today. So that's going to involve you taking off your shirt, getting you to do some movements, and also pressing around your shoulder and some special tests. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. So before we go any further, could you please confirm your name and date of birth? Uh, David Rogerson, 16 to the 10th, 92. And before we start, do you have any problems with your shoulders? A uh, little bit, a little bit of a twinge. On which side is that? Right side. On the right side. Super. So if we can get you to start off by taking off your shirt. And at this point, so if you could turn forwards for me. So in terms of having a look around the shoulder, what we're uh, checking for is initially the muscle bulk. So I'm looking over um, the trapezius muscle on both sides. We need to make sure we're assessing for um, symmetry and that there's no signs of a subluxation here or a step below the deltoid, suggesting possible dislocations. Looking along the sides of the clavicles to see if we can see any steps uh, that might indicate previous fractures that have healed or potentially concurrent fractures. Um, any obvious scars and any redness or signs of an infection. So if you could turn to face forwards for me. And again, looking at the side, we're seeing if there's any signs of obvious scars or wasting. And then turn backwards for me. And again, we're going to have a good look behind. So if you could relax your hands by your sides. So it's very important that we pay equal attention to the posterior of the patient. Again, looking at the muscle bulks, looking to see if we can see any areas of contusions, if there's anything abnormal going on here. And one of the things that we may see is wasting of the muscles on the back here. Now, whilst for um, an orthopaedic examination, we should be following the look, feel and move approach, sometimes we're going to step out of that. And uh, initially, we're going to get the patient to step against the wall, and if you could lean against the wall with your shoulders out. So with no signs of winging of the scapula here, um, and the scapula isn't coming forwards, which would suggest a problem with serratus anterior. So there are no problems there um, visually. Now we're going to palpate around the shoulder. So once again, you said there was a little bit of tenderness. Mm. Can you identify that, please? Uh, it's around here. Okay, so it's important we know where that tenderness is, and we're going to go there last. So we're comparing everywhere against that. 
Okay, and we want to check over the shoulder to see if there's any temperature that might suggest an inflammatory process. Um, so something like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or perhaps a, uh, a frozen shoulder. Starting off on the clavicular head and I'm pressing along the clavicle again, seeing if I can find any evidence of a discontinuity that might suggest um, a previous fracture, particularly if we can see scars there. Pressing directly over the acromioclavicular joint and I want to know if there's any crepitus or if there's pain directly there. I'm going to come down just below the um, acromioclavicular joint, the coracoid process, and at the, um, at the uh, crease of the shoulder, we can press down the bicep, all the way down the bicep tendon, seeing if there's any pain there. I'm going to press along the underside of the uh, acromion and then along the back of the shoulder. So if you could uh, turn around for me. So in terms of along the back of the shoulder, it helps here if we can identify the anatomy. So we want to see the supraspinatus above the spine of the scapula and the spine of the scapula will then separate our other rotator cuff muscles being infraspinatus and teres minor. And we're going to press along those, again, seeing if there's any pain, uh, any tenderness, any obvious knots or any um, uh, issues as we're palpating around. One of the other issues that we may find as we move towards the insertions of the rotator cuff is potentially steps, which may be in keeping with a, uh, a tear here. So there's no obvious issues on this side, if you could turn back for me. So now we've got the side where we've identified the pain. So I'm going to do again, coming along the clavicular head, moving along the clavicle, and then carefully pressing over the AC joint. Any discomfort there? Nope. Good. So that's reassuring from the bony side of things. Checking down over the coracoid process. Any tenderness there? That's particularly useful pressing over the coracoid process, as this is going to be one of the insertions for biceps. So as we've done on the other side, looking at the, uh, the fold at the shoulder here, I'm going to press down the bicep and see if we can see any pain with that. That's good. So, good, so there's nothing obvious there at the moment. We will, however, be testing that with some special tests in a moment. Again, pressing along the uh, acromion, and then if you could turn around for me. And we're going back to do the same as we did on the opposite side, pressing along the um, uh, belly of the supraspinatus and along the um, spine of the scapula. Again, infraspinatus and teres minor underneath, making sure you're covering all the areas, making sure there's no tenderness and again, no steps nor insertions. Now, whilst not technically part of the shoulder examination, I have found that often people presenting with shoulder pain actually have pain over the rhomboids. So it's always worthwhile to make sure you palpate over that area to see if there are any problems. OK, so we've not found anything significant at the minute, particularly with regard to the pain you've highlighted. Mm. So now we need to do movements. I like to start off getting the patient to put their arms behind their head. Here we're getting good abduction and external rotation and relax your arms down. That just gives us an overview of how well they're likely to be able to move and how far I'm going to be able to move them during the passive examination. So to start off, if I can get you to move both arms forward and up over your head. So we're flexing the arms and we should be able to go from zero up to 180. That's fine and relax down for me. And if you could turn to face the wall there, please. And now moving your arms backwards together, please. So we've got an extension there, and we should see to about 50 degrees, which is grand. So if you could turn back to face forwards for me. And palms out, and again, over the top from the side. So now, um, if you could put your hands to the side for me, and if you could try and turn your arms out. OK, so again, we've got a good uh, degree of external rotation there, and back in, but no obvious issues. Now, we can't internally rotate, so we've done external rotation so, but if we try to do internal rotation, we'll run into the abdomen. So instead, what we need to do that, if you could turn around for me, so if you could reach with one arm up your back as high as you can. Okay, so are you right or left-handed? Right. Okay, so we've got to about um, T10 there, and if you could swap to the other side. Okay, so we've got a significant difference in range of movement between the left and the right hand. So the question is, why is that? So that's looking at subscapular movement, and we can check that a little bit further by two tests. So if you could turn to face the wall uh, opposite for me, and with your left arm, if you could just put your arm up for me, 
and so I'm just going to move your arm. So if you could just hold your arm here for me, and we're looking to see if you can hold his arm in that position. If there's a, uh, a problem there, then we can actually find that arm will drop backwards. Thankfully, we're not seeing that. And we'll do the same again with this side, and try and pull that arm away for me slightly. Okay, so we're able to maintain the distance on both sides, but we can do one step further with Gerber's test. So if we could return your, uh, the good arm up and push away from me, so push, 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 push. So we've got good power there, again, good movement on subscapularis. I would do the same to this side and push away for me. Push, 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 push. Okay, so we do have weakness by comparison and obviously a little bit of pain with that. So whereabouts did that hurt when that happened? Up here. Okay, that's interesting. Mm. But um, so we have identified at least one problem to start with. Okay. So we've seen that the patient appears to have good range of movement uh, from the front, but we need to assess where that movement is coming from. So if we, um, if you let me move your hand up to the side. So in beginning adduction, the, the initial movement is going to come from supraspinatus and then deltoid. And then as we approach 90 degrees, the scapula is going to move as well. So what we should be able to see is if you could move that again, stabilising the scapula, we've got it's only once we've passed that 90 degrees that the scapula movement comes into play. If we had a problem with the glenohumeral joint, so this didn't move as well as we would like, then we may see that scapula th thoracic movement occurring much earlier on. And again, symmetry is important. So if you could move both shoulders uh, up over your head, please. So we can see an excellent range of movement happening at the same time on both shoulders. And back down again. So checking that symmetry as we're coming down. So we know that the movement is good, even if perhaps the power of this gentleman's subscapularis muscle on the right isn't as strong as it is on the left. So if you turn back forwards for me. So we've done our flexion, we've done our extension, we've done our abduction, we've done our external rotation and internal rotation. Now I'm going to do the same uh, in terms of those movements, just moving the patient passively and I'm feeling over the shoulder, am I getting a smooth range of movement? So we've got a bit of crepitus there, but nothing major. And we'll do the same again on this side, flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. Okay, so that seem so we've got good range of movement there and no obvious pain as we've done that passively. Now we need to go on to do uh, the special tests. So in terms of the special tests, we're going to start off focusing to uh, the rotator cuff. Now, when it comes to special tests, there's at least 70 different tests for the shoulder and you'll see that none of them have a particularly strong clinical significance on their own. There is some suggestion that a constellation of five of these, Hawkins test, NEARS, empty can, forced external rotation, and a painful arc, together can indicate a rotator cuff pathology. But you must view each of these on their own merits, or weaknesses may be the case. So we're going to start off with Hawkins test and what we're looking there for is signs of impingement between the, a, the greater tubercle and the acromion. So if I'm going to take your arm and we're going to flex up to 90 degrees, I'm going to um, bend your elbow and I'm trying to rotate round and that's clearly causing some discomfort there. So we're going to do the same again. Any problems there? No. Grand. So now we're going to do Nears test. If you could turn your hand in for me and just let me raise it up over your shoulder. Any problems with that? Nope. So what we've done there is we've turned the um, shoulder in so your greater tubercle is more likely to bang into the acromion and potentially ever, uh, demonstrate an impingement. And if we turn your hand in here, and again going all the way up. Any problems with that? Nope. Super. Then I want to do empty can. So if you could bring your arms forwards for me and then move them out to about 30 degrees. So now return your thumbs down, please. So this is the empty can test. We've got the arms uh, in abduction, so they've come forwards, and they're at 30 degrees off the midline, so in the scapular plane. And I'm going to push down on both arms. Is there any pain with that? 
tiny bit on, on the, the right side. Mm. Okay, so relax down for me. So we've got good strength, but again, we're eliciting pain. Thinking about how the shoulder is rotating round as we're doing that, again, likely causing an impingement as the source of that pain. Now, our NIRS test, our Hawkins test, and our empty can are all particularly focused towards the supraspinatus tendon. In terms of the other rotator cuff muscles, we will uh, look at teres minor and infraspinatus doing an external rotation. So if you could put your arms up in front of you, and in a moment you're going to turn out and I'm going to stop you. So push against me, push, 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 push. There we go, any problems with that? No. Okay. Let's just put them up there again, just for a second. And also I'm going to get you to push in against me. Okay, so any issues with that? So no. that's also letting us test subscapularis in a slightly different way. So the final thing I'll ask you to do, if you could put your hands together, raise your arms up slowly to the top of your head as you can. And I want to know if there's any pain as you're doing that. Nope. Okay. And slowly come back down again. So that's, to, uh, that's allowing us to do uh, two assessments there. Initially, we're doing the painful arc, so moving the shoulder out to the side. That can identify multiple pathology. So the frozen shoulder is a very common source of pain to the shoulder, but it will initially begin with a reduced range of movement, which we may see with this painful arc. But in that case, we're probably going to be losing uh, range of movement towards the top of the shoulder. Conversely, the painful arc will be positive between about 30 and uh, maybe 120 degrees if uh, we've got pain due to an impingement with supraspinatus tendon. Conversely, by asking him to bring his uh, arms down slowly, that's testing the strength of the tendon, particularly supraspinatus. If there was a rupture of supraspinatus, because it may be possible to overcome the rupture in lifting the arm, bringing it down as we got to about 90 degrees. If there's a discontinuity of the tendon, i.e. it's no longer holding, as you got to 90 degrees, that arm would collapse down. And we can also test against that discomfort, very similar to the forced external rotation, by doing forced abduction, abduction. So if you could push your arms out to the side, and are we getting any pain with that? So not only have we maintained good strength there, but we've also shown that there's no pain on that forced abduction. So the discomfort we've got here, we can be relatively confident that the pain here isn't due to a tear in the supraspinatus tendon. When it comes to a rupture of the supraspinatus, I did mention it's possible to still do the uh, normal abduction with that uh, muscle impaired which is a bit strange because the supraspinatus does our first 15 degrees of movement before deltoid will come in and then the scapula. However, in patients that have got this rupture, they'll often do a dip down of their arm. So the arm swings, allowing it as they stand up, the gravity will move the arm, meaning deltoid can come in so they can still do that abduction with a rupture to supraspinatus. Hence why it's important to make sure we have tested it with forced uh, abduction as well. Now we need to think about that discomfort we've got towards the front. Is it uh, an acromiocavicular problem? Probably not when we pressed over the shoulder tip there. Um, there wasn't obvious pain, but we're going to confirm that. So I'm going to do the cross um, shoulder test or scarf test, moving all the way across and I'm pressing over the acromion as we're doing so. Any pain or discomfort there? So that's reassuring, and we'll do the same again. The scarf test, I'm pressing down over the AC joint. So no problems there, kind of reinforcing what we'd seen previously. Now, we can do a test to look specifically at um, the bicep tendon. So here we're going to do speeds. So I want you to um, have, your heart, have your palm out and in a minute, with your right arm, uh, I'm going to ask you to raise your arm up and I'm going to try and stop you. Okay, so stop me pushing your arm up. Okay, is that causing any discomfort over here? A small amount. Okay, so we're going to do the same again and I'm going to palpate against the bicep tendon. So remember, we're looking towards the auxiliary fold for the position of the bicep tendon. 
So don't let me push your arm down. Is that causing discomfort? Actually, no. Okay. And we're going to check all the way down the tendon. And we must make sure we also check the, uh, the uh, distal portion of the tendon too. So no obvious discomfort there. Mm. But as we've highlighted, none of these tests on their own are sufficient normally. We'll do the same again on the opposite side. So stop me pressing your arm down. And I'm pressing into the shoulder. Any pain or tenderness here? No. Good. And again, we're going down the bicep, making sure that we're covering both uh, proximally and distally. So although our speed test is negative, as I say, we need to make sure we're covering all of the bases. So we're going to do another test called Jurgensen's. Now I'm going to take the patient's arm and it's a little bit complex. It's like we're shaking their hand. The patient is going to turn their hand outwards as I'm turning their hand inwards and I'm pressing along the bicep tendon as we do so. Okay, so please stop me turning your hand. Okay, that looks tender there, yep. but we're going to go down all the way along the bicep tendon. And any problems? Okay. Uh, so it looks like we may have a, uh, a bicep tendinopathy um, at the uh, distal portion here. We do the same again on the opposite side. So again, stop me turning your hand. Yeah, that's not very nice. Okay, it is a painful test for most people anyway. Was it worse on the right compared to the left? A little bit, yeah. Okay, so that does reinforce uh, what we're thinking about there, that we've potentially got that uh, positive pathology to the bicep. So that completes our examination shoulder. I do need to really, really highlight that these constellation of different uh, assessments shouldn't be used in isolation. And if we have problems like this with the shoulder, given it's such an important joint, um, it's often best to get appropriate imaging to uh, assist with the underlying diagnosis. So we thank our patient and make sure they get their shirt back. Any questions for you from yourself? No, no, all good, thank you. Super, well, thank you very much for your time. So um, if you've got any questions or comments about the shoulder examination, things we've done in this video, please put them down below in the comments and we'll try to cover those. And if you'd be kind enough to like the video, that tells YouTube we're here. And if you subscribe, then you'll get a notification for when we're doing the next sessions. Take care and we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.